Welcome to in this gripping video, we delve into the disturbing lives of three notorious individuals who became synonymous with terror and brutality. Brace yourself as we uncover the chilling details of their crimes, the twisted motivations that drove them, and the aftermath that left communities in shock. Get ready to explore the darkest corners of human nature in these bone-chilling stories. Scary Facts uncovers the haunting stories of Kendall Francois, Donald Henry Gaskins, and Ahmed Sirachi, shedding light on their twisted psyches and the heinous crimes they committed. Kendall Francois Kendall Francois was born in the town of Poughkeepsie and grew up on Fulton Street. He attended Arlington High School, where as a teenager he played school football until graduating in 1989. He joined the military in 1990 and went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, for basic training. In 1993, Kendall continued his studies at Dutchess County Community College as an art major until 1998. Although he was not working at the time of his arrest, he had several jobs in the past. Kendall was notably employed at Arlington High School from 1996 to 1997, a few miles from Fulton Avenue, as an instructor. Some teachers at the school complained about Kendall's behavior, especially towards female students. He often toyed with the girls inappropriately, touching their hair and telling sex jokes. The children had nicknamed him Stinky, Stinky. During the time surrounding the disappearances, Kendall Francois lived at home with her mother, father, and younger sister, who continued to deny any knowledge of the murders. Many people wondered how the parents could not know what was going on. In particular, Kendall's mother was employed as a nurse for many years at the Hudson River Psychiatric Center in Poughkeepsie. At the very least, she should have had suspicions. But Kendall reportedly told his parents that a family of raccoons had died in the attic and he was struggling to remove the carcasses. This explanation seemed to be enough for the police and the courts. In a statement released through their lawyer, the family said, we find ourselves in the throes of unimaginable circumstances. Our son is suspected of having committed serious crimes. We've lost virtually everything, we're dispossessed of our homes, and we're thrown into the street with only our clothes on our backs. The family asks that, in these extraordinary circumstances, the public and the media respect their privacy. Poughkeepsie is a student town of 30,000 inhabitants located in the state of New York and located some 110 kilometers from the metropolis of the same name. On December 9th, a woman showed up at the Poughkeepsie Police Department office. Patricia Barone comes to report the disappearance of her daughter Gina, a prostitute and drug addict. She explains to the officer taking her statement that earlier this month her daughter and her boyfriend, Richie, had a heated argument. When he returned to the motel, the young woman was no longer there. It's been 10 days since anyone has seen Gina or heard from her. Something unusual for the young woman who, despite her addiction, maintains very strong ties with her family. Gina, 1M72, 52 kilograms, was born on December 10, 1968, therefore disappeared on the eve of her 28th birthday. The young woman and her mother had moved to Poughkeepsie in 1978. The father left the mother while she was pregnant with Gina. She, therefore, had to fend for herself to raise her daughter, working most of the time to support themselves. Gina was a very wise, shy girl. At the age of 15, she began to frequent little thugs and fell into drugs. Patricia Barone discovers that her daughter is prostituting herself to buy her fix. Gina is 16 and a half years old. At 21, it's the break. Patricia decides to move into a new apartment on her own. Her daughter wanders from apartment to apartment, going to each other. At 26, Gina becomes pregnant and gives birth to a little girl, Nicole, whom she entrusts to her mother. When she disappeared, two years later, the first suspect was obviously the boyfriend, Richie, a street guy, a drug addict, committing petty crimes. But the investigators quickly come to the conclusion that he has nothing to do with Gina's disappearance. Two months later, on January 3, 1997, a new investigator was appointed. He is interested in another case of disappearance which took place on October 24 of the year 96. Another young woman vanished, Wendy Myers. She lived across the river but worked in Poughkeepsie. 
Like Gina, Wendy, 30, was a prostitute. She was reported missing in the town of Lloyd, Ulster County, New York. She was a white woman with a slim build, hazel eyes, and short, brown hair. She was last seen at the Valley Rest Motel in Highland, a small town near the shore of the Hudson, south of Kingston. The police are investigating, but without putting too much effort into it. These women are considered by their job as second-class citizens. Third Disappearance January 15, 1997 Kathleen Hurley, 45, has not been seen since she was seen on the main street in downtown Poughkeepsie. The woman frequented the same places as the other two missings and had a CJ tattoo on her left bicep. The city's prostitutes are beginning to be terrified while the police have no clues or leads to get their hands on. They interrogate boyfriends and known clients without any results. Without a crime scene, the investigation thickens. The police then draw up a questionnaire which they give to young women on the street in the hope of having a group or a report. Bingo! It sucks. Several prostitutes then mention a 26-year-old man, Kendall Francois, a corpulent black man of 1 in 93 and 160 kilograms whose hygiene leaves something to be desired. Several women complained that he was rough with them during sex. He allegedly threatened a girl with a knife, but the alleged victim did not file a complaint. Surveillance is therefore set up at 99 Fulton Avenue. The police do not take their eyes off Kendall Francois in order to learn more about him. The man lives with his parents and works in a primary school. The police install a camera in front of his house and decide to film his comings and goings for seven days. On March 7, 1997, Catherine March's mother reported the disappearance of her daughter, a brunette with blue eyes, whose last appearance was in November 1996. The police now have to deal with four disappearances and no real leads are emerging. They are no longer looking for living women but for corpses. The inspector decides to fly a helicopter over the places where prostitutes usually take their clients. What is he looking for? Traces of upturned soil. The machine, therefore, flies over the forest, the banks of the Hudson, and the agricultural land, but there too, the police draw a blank. On October 9, 1997, 27-year-old Michelle Eason went missing. She was last seen downtown, but unlike all the others who are white, Michelle is African-American. A month later, on November 13, 1997, Mary Healy Giacone, 29, was also reported missing. Her mother, who had died the previous month, is her father, a retired New York State Corrections officer, who comes to the police asking for help locating Mary so he can learn about her. Daughter the death of her mother. This time, the newspapers get involved. The Poughkeepsie Journal picks up the story and talks about a serial killer on the loose. The call to witness does nothing. It's the dead point again and again. The police decide to tighten the noose around their one and only suspect, Kendall Francois. On January 18, 1998, Kendall and her mother left their house shortly before 7 in the morning. The investigators follow them in an unmarked car. After Kendall drops her mother off at work, Detective Segrist intercepts her and her teammate and asks her to accompany them to the police station. In the interrogation room, the officer stages a table of supposed clues such as Kendall's house surrounded by a red line, photos of missing prostitutes, and pictures of Kendall, in order to make him understand that he has him as the prime suspect. But this one doesn't seem to disturb the least bit because he sees into the room. He remains calm and detached and calmly answers all the questions of the investigators. He even agrees to submit to the lie detector test. On the allegation of threats via a knife that he would have carried against a prostitute, he denies the facts by arguing that he could never have done such a thing and that it was not his style. But the inspector doesn't give up either. Kendall eventually snaps and confesses to threatening a girl with a nail file. The police, without a warrant, then go to his home, pretending to see the famous nail file in order to close the file. Kendall agrees, but will only bring one investigator into the house. The policeman who enters by the side door is immediately seized by the inventory. The cupboards have no door, 
rotten food is eaten by worms on the counter and the sink is full of dirty dishes. There are cockroaches and maggots everywhere. The inspector seeks to visit the house, but Kendall refuses, simply agreeing to take him to his messy room, littered with trash and clothes piled everywhere. While Kendall is looking for the nail file, the policeman scans the area with his eyes to try to find a clue proving his involvement in the case of the missing. Not finding the file, the man begins to get angry and turns the policeman away on the pretext that his parents do not want strangers in the house. Going down the stairs, the inspector takes the opportunity to head for the basement before Kendall grabs him to get him out. The policeman is more than convinced by this strange visit that the man is hiding something from them. He therefore makes her take the polygraph test, lie detector, which Kendall passes against all odds. On June 12, 1998, Sandra Jean French, a 51-year-old mother, also disappeared. Her three daughters said they discovered her car three blocks from Kendall's. But that won't do anything. The police again are at ground zero until a new suspect with a very charged past comes to them. Roy Chandler has a heavy criminal past and was convicted of assault and rape in South Carolina. The suspect detained at Poughkeepsie Prison for a short term is then questioned on his release. Chandler categorically denies any involvement in the missing person's case. He is a man who sometimes lives with his brother, sometimes in a tent in the woods of the city. The police then demand that he show them the places where he has camped. After a rigorous search, the investigators found nothing. The police department then decides to bring together a working group to investigate and set up a press conference. During this one, the beepers panic and start ringing. Another prostitute, Katina Newmaster disappeared in broad daylight in the same area as the previous victim. Investigators are confused. They knew the young woman with whom they had spoken two days earlier. After a phone call with an FBI agent, Inspector Segrist decides to set up a roadblock in the areas where the young woman was last seen. Posters are distributed to vehicle drivers. While the inspectors are in their car, at the main intersection of Grand Avenue, they are amazed to see a red car pass. It's Kendall Francois' car. A few seconds later, a citizen comes to meet them, distraught, telling them that he has just picked up a girl who claims to have been raped. At the service station where the man takes them, the two police officers come across a prostitute in a state of shock, almost hysterical, with bruises on her neck. She manages to explain to them while crying that this bastard Kendall had tried to kill her. He had approached him in the morning and taken him home like the previous times. They had sex, everything was going well until it was time to pay. There, Kendall grabbed the young woman and hugged her neck. The more she struggled, the more he forced his grip. She loses consciousness. A few minutes later, when she comes to, the woman is in shock. She asks him for a cigarette. He doesn't have one, so she persuades him to take her to buy some in order to get out of the house as quickly as possible. Against all expectations, he accepts and takes her to the gas station. There, the young girl takes advantage of the fact that he is slowing down to get out of the vehicle. She rushes inside the establishment. Kendall does not try to find her and continues on her way. In the afternoon, the police issue an arrest warrant against the man who is brought back to the police station where the task force is waiting for him to question him. Like the first time, Kendall Francois does not disassemble. He admits to having attacked a prostitute because he was angry with her and that he ended up calming down and walking her home. When the police tell her that they are going to search her house, Kendall no longer tries to deny it. He asks for the photos of the prostitutes and the prosecutor. He wants to confess everything. Today is September 1, 1998. He then leafs through the photos presented in front of him like a family album then says, stopping on a snapshot, I killed her and thus continues his ride. He confessed to eight murders coldly explaining how he had killed them and where he had buried them. The bodies are in the attic and in the crawl space under the house, where he lived with his father, mother, and sister. New York State Police and the city of Poughkeepsie officers surround Kendall's house and establish a security perimeter around it. Armed with the sacrosanct search warrant, they knock on the door opened to them by the father. 
This one is amazed to learn what is happening and why the police are there. The family is taken to the station for questioning while the crime scene technicians come in. They notice right away that the house is cluttered with all sorts of smelly things. In the attic, they come across human remains, five bodies, one partly dismembered, one other in a paddling pool for children, and the fifth in a garbage can and in mush. All are decomposing and the smell is drowned out by the filth lying around everywhere, especially animal excrement. The walls are covered with several centimeters of filth. In the crawl space, the technicians find the three most recent corpses. The inspection will last until nightfall and will resume the next morning at dawn, for 29 days. Three days will be needed to take the bodies out and transport them to the morgue. Every square inch of the house is raked just like the near exterior. Nothing is left to chance. Forensic pathologists are working at random to identify the bodies and the date of their death. Gina Barone died on September 3, 1998. She will be identified by her dental chart. Kendall Francois will tell that he met Gina around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning that day. He took it by car and then drove to a quiet place. Gina was furious and in a bad mood. She would have said things to him that would have knocked him out of his mind. Kendall then strangled her with all her might while raping her while she passed out. When she came to, he strangled her again for long minutes until she died. Then he hid the body at home, under his mattress for three months before taking it up to the attic where the body of Wendy Myers was already. Among the victims, the eighth will not be Michelle Eason, but another unknown, Audrey Puklis, not reported by her family or friends. Michelle Eason is still missing today. On October 13, 1998, Kendall Francois appeared before a crowded court. He is charged with eight first-degree murders, eight second-degree murders, and assault. He will be sentenced to life imprisonment without possible release after agreeing to acknowledge the facts without contesting them and without appealing. He will be transferred under number A4160 to the Attica Penitentiary Center in New York State where he will spend the rest of his life before dying there in 2014 of cancer. Here our first story ends. Before starting the second story, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Now let's move on to another dark story. Donald Henry Gaskins Donald Henry Gaskins was born on March 13, 1933 in Florence County, South Carolina, one of many illegitimate children born to his mother Yulia Parrott. Due to his small size, Donald was called Pee-wee, a name which stuck with him. Pee-wee came from an abusive childhood. Filled with neglect and physical abuse, he ever knew anything else. At the age of one, he drank a bottle of kerosene. It is reported that he had convulsions until he was around age three. In an interview, he claimed that he was picked on not only at school, but at home too. The older children took advantage of him. He said that he had to wash the other family members' feet at night. According to Gaskins, he had a younger sibling that would accuse him of things he never did, and he was always beaten for it. He didn't know his name was Donald until he landed himself in court due to a crime spree that he had been on with other young boys. They had committed robberies, assault, and gang activity. Imagine when the judge said his name, Pee Wee must have been totally confused who he was even talking to. He was convicted of those crimes and sent to a reform school. There, he claims that he was assaulted repeatedly by fellow inmates. He escaped and ended up getting married. He eventually returned to the reform school to complete his sentence. We are talking about a man that has been in and out of prison most of his life. From one prison to another, he was incarcerated for his crimes throughout his life. He was released from the reform school in 1951 and he was 18 years old. In 1953, he was working at a tobacco plantation. But it was not long until he was arrested again this time for attacking a young girl with a hammer for insulting him. Pee-wee could not allow anyone to insult him, and his violent reactions to insults is something that happened throughout his entire life. For that crime, he was sentenced to six years. In prison he was assaulted many times by gangs of fellow inmates. Knowing that it would only continue if he did nothing, he chose to stand up to the most feared inmate of all. 
That man was Hazel Brazell. Pee-wee got three more years tacked onto his sentence, but he now had a name for himself. No longer were attacks directed at him, now he would be the one assaulting others. In 1955, he escaped again. He hid in the back of a garbage truck and soon fled to Florida, where he joined a traveling circus. Somewhere along the line he got into trouble again and found himself back in prison. He was paroled in August of 1961. An odd fact about Pee Wee Gaskins, he owned a hearse and drove it everywhere. He told all the locals that he carried dead bodies and yet, no one really believed him. I wonder if anyone ever dared to peek inside? From everything I have read, the locals were scared to death of the man. Such a little guy, but he learned quick how to come across as a big guy you don't mess with. Two years after his parole, he was arrested again. This time it was due to the attack on a young girl. Those charges had caught up with him. But before he could be sentenced, he escaped again. It seems the law was constantly hunting down Gaskins, because they caught him again and sent him to prison, this time for eight years. He did his time and was paroled again in 1968. Moving to Sumter, he worked for a roofing company. But with a taste for crime, he began a killing spree. He found out that he could pick up hitchhikers. With plenty of wayfaring people out on the highways, he had a field day picking them up, torturing them and killing them. It is unknown how many he killed, but this killing spree would last a very long time. He would kill people and dump them in local swampy areas. He drove the coastal highways and this is where be named those killings as coastal kills. Pee Wee put his kills in two categories, coastal kills and personal kills, the ones that he said did him wrong. Coastal kills were for his pleasure. Gaskins claimed that he knew when it was time to kill by the bothersome feelings, stomach pains, headaches and pains in the groin. When he started his coastal drives, he wasn't even sure what he was doing out there on the road. It didn't take long for him to figure that out. A young blonde hitchhiker met her doom as she was headed for Charleston. Gaskins claimed he asked for sex and she made the fatal mistake of laughing at him. No one laughed at Pee Wee. He beat her unconscious and pulled off the highway onto a dirt road. There he tortured her and assaulted in every way. Went on to mutilate her and she was still alive when he weighted her body down into the swamp. His memory of this kill? I felt truly the best I ever remembered feeling in my whole life. Less than a year later, eleven more died at his hands. When it was time, I went and killed, he said. Accidental kills were not something that applied to Gaskins, but this time he thought he had found two girls when they were long-haired boys. Choosing to not care about the gender, he picked them up. He assaulted them both, cooked them and ate some body parts while they were still alive. Being fond of a particular victim still got them nowhere. Gaskins didn't remember the names of most of his victims. But, he did remember one victim's name. Sixteen-year-old and Culberson came into his view while he wasn't on the hunt. In an interview, he said that since she was so nice to me, he stunned her with a hammer before slicing her throat and dumping her in quicksand. His 15-year-old niece Janice Kirby was nothing but another young girl to fantasize about. This went on in his mind for a time. It got the best of him and an opportunity came up. Needing a ride home after a night of drinking, Janice and a friend hopped in his car. He took them to an abandoned house and tried to assault them. Fighting for their lives, they hit him with a board. But Gaskins came back at them with a gun and beat them unconscious. He assaulted them both and then drowned them. It is reported that his coastal kills were many. He killed one about every six weeks. I have seen reports that said it was more like one per month. That's just the kills for his pleasure. Gaskins said that every time that he felt uneasy, unsettled or edgy, he would make a pleasure hit. Those he didn't show any mercy to. He would torture them, keeping them alive as long as he could and then he would mutilate them. He confessed to using several different methods of killing, stabbing, suffocation, mutilation and even cannibalism. The personal kills had it a little easier. He just shot them. Seems a little backwards to me.
Other personal kills were for many reasons, mocking him, attempting to blackmail him, they owed him money, or he had been paid to kill them by someone who wanted them dead. In 1973, he murdered two neighbors, Doreen Dempsey, 23 years old, and her two-year-old daughter. Dempsey was also eight months pregnant. This might have been a personal kill. One report was that he was angry because she was involved with an African-American and to Pee Wee, that was wrong. Another report I came across stated that she had been involved with Pee Wee and that the baby she was carrying was his. This has not been proven. In February 1975, Gaskins was hired to kill a boyfriend of Suzanne Kipper Owens. Silas Barnwell Yates met his fate at Gaskins' hand and lost his life. Something went wrong with that kill and he ended up having to kill four more people, allowing him to cover up the hit kill of Yates. Gaskins had many others who were involved with him in his various crimes, but if they went against him, there would be a high price to pay. By his confessions, he killed many more people than bodies ever found. Many of them were more than likely those who might have not learned what he was capable of. But one man decided that he had had enough and he turned witness against Gaskins. Walter Neely, an associate of Gaskins, confessed to police that he had witnessed Gaskins killing of other associates, Dennis Bellamy and Johnny Knight, who was only 15 years old. Neely must have felt that he would be safer confessing to the police than facing Gaskins' wrath. During their relationship, Gaskins had told Neely about many other killings, many missing persons around the area over the past five years. Gaskins was arrested in November of 1975 because of Neely's betrayal. The next month, Gaskins led officers to some land that he owned in Prospect. There they discovered eight bodies. This would be the end of Gaskins' freedom, but believe it or not, it would not end his killings. He was charged on eight counts on May 24, 1976. He was sentenced to death, but his sentence was later commuted to life in prison. From his own cell, which was connected through a wall, Gaskins carried out a murder of fellow inmate, who was on death row. His name was Rudolf Tyner. While in prison, Gaskins was hired to kill Tyner by Tony Chimo, the father of Tyner's victim in a robbery-slash-murder case. Gaskins tried killing Tyner in several different ways and failed each time. Growing tired of the fight, he found a way that would not fail. Through communicating with some unknowns, he rigged up an explosive and managed to make a radio device. He told Tyner that they could communicate to each other through the speaker. Tyner must have been lonely and desperate for friendship and believe Gaskins. After being poisoned several times in his food and drink, Tyner held the speaker to his ear. On the other side of the wall, the wires coming through a vent, Gaskins could now set off the explosives that would kill Tyner. Gaskins bragged later that the last thing Tyner heard was me laughing. He kept his promise to Chimo. This gave him a death sentence of his own. Looks like the state grew tired of Gaskins' kills or they feared for their own lives since Gaskins could kill even inside the prison. If he could kill an inmate from his own cell, what else could Pee Wee Gaskins do? Journalist Wilton Earl communicated with Gaskins and published a book about Gaskins' life and his confessions. Gaskins confessed to over 100 kills. Not all could be proven, but it leads us to wonder if it might just be true. He also claimed to kill the 13-year-old daughter of then-Senator James Catino Jr. of Sumter. This was never proven. Seems that Gaskins either feared the chair, or he didn't want anyone else to do him in. Hours before he faced his execution, he tried to kill himself by slicing his wrists with a razor that he had swallowed and later coughed up. Gaskins' final words were, I'll let my lawyers talk for me. I'm ready to go. He was known as the most prolific serial killer in the South Carolina's history. Do you believe Gaskins' childhood influenced his later life of crime? Here ends our second story. Leave us your opinion in the comments. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Now let's move on to another dark story. Ahmed Sirachi. Ahmed Sirachi was born on January 10, 1949, in North Sumatra, Indonesia. He worked as a cattle breeder and a dukuan, an Indonesian term for a shaman reputed to possess supernatural powers. 
Sirachi was a rebellious and uneasy child who never easily befriended anyone. He ran away from home by the age of 19 and was jailed for 10 years for violent behavior. Before becoming the infamous sorcerer, he was working as a cattle breeder but was not satisfied with his job. He became restless and started practicing sorcery. He had three wives, and all of them were siblings. In Indonesia, people frequently hold beliefs in sorcery and the paranormal, particularly in underdeveloped rural areas with low levels of education. There is such a strong belief in black magic that those who are accused of practicing it have been put to death. Just before starting to kill, Suraji said that his deceased father appeared in his dream and told his son to become a mystic healer to acquire more power. To achieve this, Suraji had to drink the saliva of 70 dead young women. He believed there was no other way for him to become more powerful, but he thought it would take him too long to find 70 dead young girls, so he concocted a horrible shortcut to achieve his goals. In 1987, he started murdering young women. It was 1987, a time when women in Indonesia believed a Dukuan could make them more beautiful and bring greater wealth to them. One day, a woman made her way to the local Dukuan Saraji for help becoming wealthy and beautiful. He told her to walk through the sugarcane field that was near his house. Saraji said that he must perform rituals in the field. While walking with the woman, he led her toward a hole. He told her to stand in the hole. The hole was deep enough to reach up to her shoulders. Ahmed started filling the hole, rendering her unable to move. She got nervous and asked him when she would be able to get out of the hole. Sadly, she wouldn't leave the hole alive. Right after trapping her, Sirachi strangled her throat with a cable, killing her. After strangling her, Sirachi gathered the saliva that was dripping from her mouth and drank it. He stripped the woman naked and buried her finishing the heinous act by making sure that her head was facing his house. The story doesn't end here, this was just the beginning of horrific incidents. Sirachi was thirsty for power. He had to kill 69 more women for his evil purpose. Many prostitutes started visiting him to attract more men, believing it would enhance their wealth. Sirachi thought that killing prostitutes would be less dangerous because they were not connected with their families and no one would ask about their disappearance. According to his twisted beliefs, Sirachi needed 70 women to kill. He couldn't kill every woman who came to him. He had to be cautious and selective. But nothing would stop him from achieving his goal. He started killing one after another, and no one noticed. Women would come to him for advice, and Sirachi would lead them to the sugarcane field to perform the ritual. The poor women had no idea that he was digging their graves. After leading them to the hall, the so-called Dukuan wrapped the cord around their necks and took their lives. My father did not specifically advise me to kill people. He just told me to collect the saliva of 70 young women. So I was thinking that it would take a long time if I had to wait to get these numbers. I was trying to get to it as fast as possible, so I took my own initiative to kill. Ahmed Sirachi's statement to the police. No matter how powerful and cunning a murderer may be, there comes a time when they slip up and they're discovered. Something similar happened to Ahmed Sirachi. He thought that he could continue his attacks with no one noticing. But a man saw the decomposing dead body of a 21-year-old girl while passing through the sugarcane field. She was identified as Sri Kamala Dewey. She left home three days earlier to find bread and butter for her family. On investigation, a rickshaw driver testified that he dropped Sri Kamala in front of the Sirachi's home. Police immediately approached Sirachi's house, and after completing an extensive search of it, they found Dewey's handbag, clothes, and bracelet. Sirachi was arrested on April 27, 1997, and charged with the murders of 42 young women. At first, Sirachi denied the accusation, but as the investigation intensified, he started confessing. The experts were unable to establish any sexual foul play, and Ahmed Sirachi rejected the accusation of sexual assault against the victims. He said that he just wanted to earn money and power by killing the women. It was difficult for the investigation team to get the dead bodies of all 42 women, so they brought in bulldozers to hasten the excavation process. 
the forensic expert Alfred Seisho said that it was all bones and skulls except for five bodies. Among these five bodies was Sri Kemala Dewey, and the other four remained unidentified. Seisho told the media that the only way to identify the victims was through the DNA process, but at that time they didn't have enough samples to do so. Police suspected that the victims may have been too ashamed to inform their families that they had sought the sorcerer's assistance, so their disappearances were not linked to him. Many of the victims were prostitutes. After discovering the 40 corpses, the police asked residents to report missing female family members. About 80 families in the area have reported relatives missing, so it's possible that Ahmad Sarachi may have killed even more women. Ahmed Sarachi went to trial in December 1997. On December 11, he faced an irate team of prosecutors who were seeking the death penalty for him. Since the victims were not identified, the prosecutor's team was having difficulty finding evidence against Sarachi. It took seven months to collect the evidence and line up the witnesses. The trial was mostly affected by social opinion. People had shown strong hatred towards Sarachi. People gathered outside the court and shouted, let us kill him. On April 27, 1998, following a four-month trial, he was convicted of the killing of 42 women. Sirachi was sentenced to death, along with his wife, Tumanai. The court found that she had intentionally helped Sirachi in the killings. Later, her sentence was changed to life imprisonment. On July 10, 2008, Hamad Sirachi was finally executed for his crimes. Ahmed Saraji had three wives, and all three were siblings. In Islam, it is prohibited to marry siblings. A police inspector personally believed that there were more than 42 bodies. From 1987 to 1997, at least 80 villagers reported their missing family members. Ahmed Saraji was imprisoned several times for robbery, livestock theft, and property vandalism. According to a psychologist who analyzed him, Sarachi had an antisocial personality disorder. The Indonesian actor Wawan Wanasar played the role of Ahmed Sarachi in the film, which was based on the true story of the black magic serial killer. After killing, Ahmed Sarachi buried all the women completely, with their heads pointing toward his house. According to him, this would bring more power. As we conclude our journey through the lives of Kendall Francois, Donald Henry Gaskins, and Ahmed Sarachi, we are left with a haunting reminder of the terrifying capabilities that lurk within the human mind. These stories serve as cautionary tales, urging us to remain vigilant and aware of the darkness that can manifest in unexpected places. While we may never fully comprehend the depths of their depravity, Twisted Tales stands as a chilling testament to the harrowing realities of the human condition. Let these stories serve as a chilling reminder that evil can take many forms, and we must always strive to protect ourselves and those around us from its grasp.